of the Scleral Lens Society. After owning and managing three private practices in Arizona and California, Dr. Wu realized her true passion within optometry was specialty contact lenses. She is currently an optometrist at and owner of the Contact Lens Institute of Nevada in Las Vegas, Nevada. In her spare time, Dr. Wu is an avid wine collector and is a level two WSET sommelier. Here is Dr. Wu with Beyond the Limbus, contact lens options for complex patients. Thanks everybody. I'm just gonna share my screen now. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody for joining me and, and thanks so much to Berkeley for offering me this opportunity uh, to, to lecture to you guys. So looking forward to sharing this information with you. So first we're gonna start with a lecture called A Trip Beyond the Limbus. Basically, we're just gonna go over contact lens options for patients that have complex corneas um, that are basically beyond the limbus. So in the past, we know that corneal GPs have been amazing for complicated corneas. But for this lecture specifically, we're going to talk <clears throat> mostly about contact lens options beyond the limbus, so going past that limbal area. Um, I do own a private practice in Las Vegas, Nevada. My clinic is in, dedicated entirely to contact lens patients, so it's very, very exciting. And just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Clark Chang. Uh, he and I were the ones that originally developed this lecture. We presented it at Vision Expo a few years back. So a lot of the content that you'll see today is from him. Here's my financial disclosures. I'm very lucky to work with and consult for a variety of companies. And just kind of a um, rough start on gas permeable lens optics, just a refresher. When we have a complicated cornea, such as what we see in the picture, so let's say it's some sort of a keratoconus cornea or something else that has irregular astigmatism, you've got that gas permeable lens material. And the whole reason is so that it forms a tear layer behind the posterior surface of the contact lens. And then that gives us that smooth optical quality, which results in better vision. So these are some really cool pictures. Uh, these were two professors when I was going to school, Dr. Chang and Dr. Lam. So you can see this is a very typical with the rule astigmatism when, you, when you're checking a topography. And if you were to put on a spherical gas permeable lens, this is the pattern you would see. So you would see at the inferior and superior where that astigmatism is, there's gonna be some clearance there. And then you've got some bearing at that three and nine area. Very, very typical for patients that have regular astigmatism. Same thing here for somebody that's got against the rule astigmatism, you have basically just changed the bearing position. You've got the lift off at three and nine, and then you've got uh, the, the touch at six and 12. So gas permeable lens options have really helped us a ton with these complicated corneas and, and there's lots of indications, lots of research showing the safety and the efficacy of these types of lenses. And so they are amazing. But sometimes we need to, to reach for something else because the contact lens options are, are not uh, viable. The patients maybe can't tolerate the comfort of the lens maybe the lens is popping out. So like in this picture, what we're looking at is a gas permeable lens that's uh, so inferior lifted off, you can see that gap, that's that area of air. And so in this particular patient, this person is gonna have lens awareness. They're gonna be able to fill the lens every time they blink. And because of so much edge lift, that lens is likely going to dislodge on a, on a very frequent basis. So these are some of the patients that 
we've really discovered can benefit from some of these lenses that are larger in diameter. So basically, we're going to go over some different uh, categories of some of the different lens designs and kind of go over case reports of each type. This is just a, um, a little graph kind of showing us if, you, if we have a regular cornea. So this is not somebody that has any irregularity. But if they're a regular cornea and they have corneal sill less than or equal to two diopters, here's some of the options we have. We've got spherical GPs, we've got soft toric GPs, and now we've got hybrid and sclerals. If they have more than two diopters of cylinder, now we're gonna move on to a bitoric GP, a soft toric lens, and also a hybrid and scleral. If they have any sort of residual cylinder, then we're gonna have to add that front surface toricity to a gas permeable lens if they're in a corneal GP a soft toric lens, or a front toric scleral. So first, let's talk about hybrid lenses. The point of hybrid lenses is that they have a gas permeable lens center and a soft contact lens skirt. The great news is these have evolved over time. Uh, when, when hybrid lenses first came out, uh, a lot of times, patients or doctors would complain of neovascularization because either the lens wasn't moving or the decay of the materials was not oxygen permeable enough. Also, the junction between the gas permeable lens and the soft lens was not that great, so it would peel off and, and kind of disconnect. And that doesn't happen anymore with hybrid lenses. Those are, those are two things that we don't really have to worry about. But the whole premise behind hybrid lenses is that you get the gas permeable lens center. So you've got that really good optical clarity of a GP lens, but then you've got the comfort of a soft skirt. So it's kind of like piggybacking. So piggybacking where we put a soft lens on first and then a GP lens on second, um, kind of a, a similar concept. So the good news is there's a silicone hydrogel skirt now it used to be hydrogel, now it's changed for, for the better. And there's a very, very high DK GP center. Good news also is that the GP lens material actually blocks UV light, which is really, really important for a lot of doctors. We know that UV light can cause a lot of diseases in the future. So anything we can do to kind of limit the amount of UV light getting to our patient's eye I think has become real important. Like we said before, there, there's that junction kind of highlighted in green, and that's where the, the gas permeable lens meets the soft lens. And what we're looking for is we want a little bit of, of vault there. So we, we do want to see that there is some fluorescein and clearance there. This video kind of shows an ideal fit so you've got um, alignment with the gas permeable lens. And then we've got um, where the junction is, there is that nice band of highlighted that green area showing us that there is a lot, there is some fluorescein there. So that's the goal for hybrid lenses. And in this case, is the, this is just the regular duet, which is indicated for regular corneas. So an ideal candidate for these types of lenses would be patients that have corneal sill and they're desiring better vision. Um, let's say that they're in a soft toric lens now, but it doesn't go high enough. Um, maybe it, they have a, a strange axis and so it, it's not exact. You know, most tor soft toric lenses go every 10 degrees. Maybe they need something in a five degree. Uh, this, this would be a good candidate. Um, patients that are very highly active. So if you've got a patient wearing a corneal GP lens and they say, you know what, doc, I, um, I, I feel like my lens dries out or it dislodges, things like that, might be a good idea to switch them to a hybrid lens or at least consider that. Patients that have high amotropia, so if they've got a lot of minus or a lot of plus and, um, and they don't even have to have cylinder, um, a hybrid lens could, lens could be a good option for them. And then I really like hybrid lenses for patients that need multifocals. 
there's not that many options on the market as far as uh, soft toric lenses that also have multifocal optics. There's only a, a, a few out there. So it really limits the amount of um, options that we have for these types of patients. And then also patients that want to wear contacts, but they're in glasses and they've never been able to get out of glasses. So just gonna go over a, a case report. This was an interesting patient that I saw a, a few years back. She's a 29 year old Hispanic female. She comes in because she complains that her right eye is really blurry and she's getting constant headaches. She's never worn glasses or contacts before. Um, in fact, I don't even remember if she's if she had a um, recent eye exam or, or if she's ever had an eye exam. I, I can't remember that. So her vision at distance, uncorrected, is 2050 in the right eye and 2020 in the left. And her near vision is 2060 in the right eye and 2030 in the left. So right there, that's a red flag. If you have someone that young, 29 years old, and their near vision is worse than their distance, that leads us to believe there is some sort of accommodation issue going on or some sort of um, underlying hyperopia. So her Ks show that she does have some corneal cylinder in both eyes. Her manifest refraction shows exactly what we thought. Uh, she's got some latent hyperopia and she's also got some cylinder. So this is interesting because her refractive cylinder, as you can see, so the right eye, she's only accepting minus four. But when we look at her Ks, she's really over a five. Um, so that leads us to believe, well, she either is not taking all of the cylinder or she's got some residual cylinder. And in this case, I would say most cases were, especially for a patient that has never worn glasses before with this amount of a prescription, it's more likely that she's just not accepting her entire amount of astigmatism so she probably will accept that five diopters eventually. It's just, this is her first refraction. It's, we didn't do it damp, uh, we did it dry. So that could also be an issue. So that's my suspicion is that she really will end up accepting all of that cylinder, but she's just, um, it's her, her first eye exam. So she just, her accommodation is, is just too strong right now. Everything anterior and posterior segment within normal limits, everything looks great. So at this point I explained to her, there's a lot of options we have. We can do glasses, we can do a corneal GP lens, we can do a custom soft lens, we can do a hybrid. I went over pros and cons with, with the patient and she ended up deciding the hybrid lens. Um, she had friends that had worn corneal GPs that had had some issues with comfort. So she didn't want to go down that route. Uh, with glasses, she said, I just, I hate having something on my face. Um, I definitely would like to try contact lenses if that's an option at all. So basically we just kind of de de debated between the custom soft and the hybrid. I did think that the hybrid lens was going to be the best option for her. So that's why we ended up going with that one. So we ordered a hybrid lens and the, the beauty of hybrid lenses is you can do these empirically now. Uh, so basically you just send them the Ks and the manifest refraction, that's it. They design it for you. So with their calculations, they uh, designed everything for me. When we uh, saw her for dispense, she's seen 2030 in the right eye and 2020 in the left eye. And she does have a, an over refraction. Here is the um, lens on her eye. So you can see the, the centration is, is pretty good there. So we've got the corneal GP in the center, followed by the soft skirt on the outside. So the corneal GP, you want it to be pretty well centered, definitely covering the pupil, which it is. And then for the soft lens, you want it to be similar to like a regular soft contact lens. So when they blink, you should see the soft lens move just very minorly. If you have a lot of movement, that's going to be really uncomfortable for the patient. They might have fluctuating vision. Um, and if it's completely stuck on, 
that lens is going to be kind of difficult to remove. That could cause corneal warpage over time. So you really want it to act like a soft contact lens fit. So we dispensed those because she was seeing quite well and I wanted her to get used to um, inserting or removing the lens. <clears throat> and then I decided to reorder the, the left eye with that residual prescription. Um, so change the prescription in the left eye. And then one month later, she actually ended up seeing 20-20 in both eyes. She said that her, her vision and headaches were much improved. And she was also really happy with the comfort and the vision with the hybrid lenses. So this is a great, and she's been actually wearing these for like four years now. So this is a patient that's been really, really successful, which has been awesome. So for hybrid lenses, the take home, you can, they are a really good option for patients that are looking to try contacts, but their contact lens prescription maybe falls out of some of the standard contact lens parameters uh, that we can get with soft lenses. They're really good at masking corneal sill. Something important to remember about hybrid lenses is they won't help with any residual cylinder. So if you do have a patient and they are requiring extra cylinder, you're not going to get that with a hybrid lens. It can only correct corneal sill at this point. Hybrid lenses are something that's great because you don't, the patients can't get this online or at a big box store or anywhere else. They can only get it from a licensed doctor. So from your office, they can't just take your prescription and go down the street. I know with contacts, that's something we're concerned about now, uh, especially those of us in private practice. So it can help build loyalty and, and, and really keep this the, the contact lenses in your own practice. The multifocal designs are awesome. Um, they're launching a new one uh, at, in, in a couple of weeks at GSLS, which is gonna be another amazing type of, of multifocal. It actually uses um, um, extended depth of focus as far as the multifocal optics. So that's gonna be really exciting. And uh, there's been some really great research on, on that new design. This is their progressive, uh, Duet Progressive. So you still have the corneal GP in, in, the, in the center of the lens. And you it's basically similar to a, an aspheric soft multifocal. So most of them have a near center and then it kind of blends out into the distance, which is how the Duet Progressive is. So if you do have interest in the Duet Progressive, it does have similar optics as some of the soft multifocals that you're currently probably fitting. So it's real easy to fit um, hybrid lenses that have multifocal optics. You really only need a couple other things. So you need their refraction, you need their Ks, and then you need their ad power and their dominant eye. It's really important to educate the patients I always tell patients the lenses are different than the last contacts you've worn. They are gonna feel different, but as you wear the lenses more and more, the comfort's gonna improve. Especially for uh, patients that, if you're doing a multifocal, I always tell patients it's gonna have this 3D effect. It's gonna be kind of shadowy. It's gonna look a little bit odd and that's normal. Usually gets better within a few weeks. And I never see a patient back before two weeks because it takes that long to kind of adapt to the optics. So I always tell them there is gonna be this 3D effect or shadowing at near and that's completely normal. So another great thing about hybrid lenses, it does not rely on any sort of toric ballast system. So it doesn't matter if it rotates on the eye. So you can put it in no matter, whatever way it needs to go in, um, when it's on the eye, it can spin around. It doesn't matter because it's masking the corneal sill and it doesn't require any sort of weighted areas, uh, unlike soft toric lenses where you've got to put it in a certain way and then it has to center in a certain way in order for them to have clear vision. Also has that built-in UV protection. That's really important for me living in the Southwest area where the sunlight's really strong. Want to make sure that we can protect patients' eye from from UV light as much as possible. And you can only order it through independent eye care providers. So again, for someone like me in private practice, that is important. 
So super annoying when patients come in, you do all this work, you're seeing them for all their follow-ups, you're reordering, you're doing their training. And the worst thing is when they come in and they say at the end of the fitting, okay, I'd like my prescription now. It's, it's really frustrating. And, and when you do some of these more custom lenses in office really prevents that from, from being an issue. So let's talk about scleral lenses and their, their use with regular corneas. So they do have some similarities. You, you, you get this stability and centration, which is awesome for any contact lens. <clears throat> you get increased comfort due to reduced lid interaction. So it's kind of counter counterintuitive. The smaller the contact lens, the more uncomfortable. And why is that? It's because when you put a small contact lens on, it moves a lot. So the movement is what's causing that discomfort. And with the, when you have a scleral lens, it's really large. And so it gets tucked underneath those eyelids and can help with lens sensation and discomfort. Normal corneas have more predictable shapes. So there's less troubleshooting and complications for the most part. And because these patients don't have diseased eyes, they have a better tear film quality um, they're not producing a lot of mucin, such, you know, unlike a lot of our dry eye patients or patients with corneal transplants, and their endothelium is usually intact and functioning. So real, it, it's a lot easier to fit normal eyes with scleral lenses. Can also reduce scleral lens fogging. So this is something that is a real common complication with scleral lens patients. But um, patients that have normal corneas, they don't get this issue as, as often. Edge blanching is also less common and less severe, which is great. Uh, this is a patient on the left that's got a larger diameter lens and you can see with that edge, that does not look good. Um, it's pushing into the, to the edge of the eye, causing a lot of pressure and then causing a lot of backup of blood flow inside. Um, so that's not good. But uh, the lens on the right is about a 14.5 diameter, so going a little bit beyond the limbus. And you can see even those little tiny little blood vessels are going underneath the edge of the lens really nicely. So who is a good candidate? Similar candidacy in hybrid lenses. So patients that have um, moderate to severe eyes can also help because you've got that bath of liquid that's just bathing the cornea all day. And we're gonna just go through a quick case report here. So we've got a 22 year old Asian female and she is a veterinary student. And she complains that her vision is blurry off and on. And she's got uh, 2025 vision in the right eye 2060 in the left. And I noticed that her, her soft toric lens is rotated 45 degrees. So first I just said, well, let's just refit you with a, another soft toric lens and we'll see you back. But then we saw her back in two weeks and she had the same issues. So now instead of going down the road of fitting her with every single soft toric lens, I think that's gonna be a waste of time. Already tried one and that didn't work. So now we need to do something else. Um, here's a, a, a topography. It's, it's interesting because the top topography is her right eye. That looks a little bit more regular, I guess, in shape. And the left eye is, it's got a little bit, um, less of a symmetrical appearance as far as the superior or inferior. And so that's the only reason I can think of of why the, re the lens was rotating um, 45 degrees. So we discussed all the options and we decided to refit her into a mini scleral lens. In this case, the lens that I used was the OneFit PNA. This was the original um, uh, lens from Blanchard. It's called the OneFit PNA. They don't really use this one anymore. They've changed to the OneFit 2.0 and the OneFit Med. But at the time, this was the, the lens that they had available. And the, the way that you use this lens is you, you choose the base curve based off of their Ks. And so I looked at her K values and, um, and then you fit it kind of on the, on the flat or steep K or an average K, I can't remember. But anyway, 
we picked it, it looks like uh, the steeper K, just to see what is going on here. And we've got similar fluorescein patterns at insertion in both eyes. So you can see here, what we're looking at, that green band is the fluorescein. So we're putting that in the bowl of the scleral lens, putting that on, and then looking at it with the slit lamp. So you can see it looks pretty good. So we've got some equal amounts of fluorescein coverage. Um, it's extending inferior and, in, and superior beyond the limbus even, which is great. And then you always allow the lenses to settle and then check the OCT and then check the clearance again. The central clearance in the left eye was 200 microns, or the right eye is 200 microns and the left eye is 210. And then with the slit lamp exam, the, the edges appear to line with no blanching or vessel compression. So that's great news. So with an overrefraction, she was able to achieve 2020 in the right eye and 2020 in the left eye. So all we do is we add the overrefraction to the diagnostic power of the lens, and that's basically how we order it every or everything. And two years later, she's still doing great, no issues. the The lenses still look really good, and uh, no problems with the cornea or the conjunctiva at all. Something I did want to discuss was insertion and removal of scleral lenses. So these are one of the main reasons that patients are discouraged. And it's the biggest form of, uh, or the biggest reason of, of dropout with scleral lenses. They can't get the lenses in or they can't get the lenses out. Make sure that you are going through several different techniques when they come in for their dispense and their training. I like to show them a video, it's free. It's on sclerolens.org, which is the Scleral Lens Society. It's a nonprofit organization, but they've um, got these videos where you can show patients how to properly insert and remove scleral lenses. Um, and then patient handouts and resources. I like to give them a list of resources where it lists out exactly what to do step-by-step. Step. And I tell them in case, you find that uh, you get home, you forget everything that we just talked about, you'll be able to look at this little card or this little information sheet with pictures and know exactly what to do. Here's a few ways to insert scleral lenses. The most common way is right here where they're holding the plunger and you're putting the scleral lens right on top and then you're using the other hand to control the eyelids. Next, is an O-ring. Um, this is something you can get at the hardware store for like 10 cents, but basically it provides a little balancing structure for the lens. And then notice that she only needs one finger now to balance the lens compared to her other, other fingers here where she can control the lower eyelid now. This is something called the Easy Eye Applicator. It's basically a rubber ring, so it's easy to fit onto any finger size. And then it's got this little lens well, and then you just put the scleral lens inside of the well, and then you put the, the lens in. So those are, the, the last two are good ways for patients to insert lenses, especially if they're used to using one finger. So if this patient had already been wearing contact lenses, whether it's soft or GP, and they're used to inserting their lens with just one finger, I find that some of those other techniques can work a little bit better. If you have a patient that hates using lenses and uh, they, or they hate using devices, they don't want to be reliant on anything, you can teach them how to put a scleral lens in just by balancing it on their fingers. So you can either do the tripod, which is the three fingers where they're balancing the lens. You can even have them just balance it in, the, in between the crevice of their two fingers. And if they really have problems, there's this scleral lens stand. What's happening here is you're balancing the plunger um, on this little stand and it actually connects to a little green light so that you click on the light. And so what they're looking at is basically a green light and that gives them the, the ability to use both fingers to hold the upper and lower eyelids. So this gives them the most control. And then they just kind of lower their whole face
down to the scleral lens. So a lot of questions, a lot of doctors ask me, when do you usually see a scleral lens follow-up? Um, so after their dispense, I always see them around one or two weeks later, depending on what's going on with them. Um, I'll see them a month later, three months, and then depending on the condition, I might see them six months. Um, and then what you want to look for is staining and edema on the cornea. Of course, you want to check the limbus as well, check for staining and edema, and then check for lens deposits and fogging to see if everything's going okay there. Then you're going to ask them, what's their wear time? What's their comfort? Um, how are they inserting and removing the lens? What are they using to fill the bowl of the lens? And what are they using to clean the lenses? It's really important to ask them this every single time, because even if the patient has told you, um, I'm using this solution, which is what you told me to use uh, every, every time you see them, they will randomly I don't know if it's that they forget or maybe they're just looking for a deal. I have no idea, but sometimes I'll see these patients and they've done so well all every time I've seen them. And then I'll ask them randomly at their next visit, like I always do. And then they'll say, oh yeah, I'm using um, this soft contact lens solution to clean my scleral lenses. So it's, that's why it's so important to educate the patients on this and make sure that they are aware of uh, what's what's uh, pro what's appropriate for this type of of um, of type type of lens. Okay, then the another um, reason it's important to use scleral lenses and, and important for centration and things is multifocals. So this is a patient that's wearing a scleral multifocal, and you can see those little hash marks is where the optical center is of the near optics. And you can see it's off center. So this is, it's inferiorly temporally displaced, which is where scleral lenses go. And so that's why it's important to make sure that the lenses are pretty well centered because you wanna make sure that the optics are as best as they can be for that patient. With multifocal designs for scleral lenses, most are concentric or aspheric designs. I would say majority out there are probably a, a spheric center near, which is very common. Um, that's what we're really used to for a lot of these scleral, or a lot of the multifocals that we're already using. And they do not translate, so you don't have to worry about that. They're really customizable. So you can change the diameter of scleral lenses. You can change their base curve, uh, peripheral curves, their add power. Um, you can do front toric, you could do peripheral toric and quadrant specific. So scleral lenses have really become amazing as far as you're able to customize them in many different ways, which is really exciting. Um, great vision, great comfort. Um, you can fit regular and irregular corneas and multifocals. And then again, patients are not gonna get this from every eye doctor. So if you're looking for a way to differentiate yourself, scleral multifocals are an incredible option. So moving on to irregular corneas, um, there's a lot of different options we have. So we all, like we said, we're not gonna talk about some of the corneal uh, designs. We're, we're really focusing on some of these uh, designs in this lecture that go beyond the limbus. So you can do soft. There are soft contact lenses that are custom for patients that have irregular corneas. Uh, we, there's hybrid lenses and there's scleral designs. So let's just talk about custom soft lenses. These are great because they're, they're easier to handle um, than other lens designs. And They've got a thicker center. So with these custom soft lenses, that thicker center is masking the, the corneal irregularity. And then they use a lenticular carrier, which will improve the oxygen at the limbus and those stem cells. So when are we gonna use reverse geometry uh, soft custom lenses. You can use it for post-refractive surgery. So anybody that's had LASIK or RK, 
um, maybe even a corneal transplant, trauma, and other oblate topographies. So let's just go over a case report. A 65-year-old male who's got keratoconus, and he has been wearing gas permeable lenses for 25 years. He has a left eye uh, staining with a scar. He sees 2025 in the right eye and 2040 to 2060 in that left eye with his, his current GP lenses. So you can see there's a lot of staining on that eye in that bottom left, that fluorescein photo. Um, and this is just an interesting photo of the Placido disc as far as the topography. You can see it's very irregular in that area. So fit him into the Novacone, which is a custom keratoconus lens, and he's seen 2020, so that is awesome. This is a cool photo, I think, which really demonstrates the um, optics and why, it, why these custom lenses work. So you can see on the top photos, those are Placido disc images of just the naked cornea. And then the bottom images are when we put that custom lens on, you can see how much smoother the rings are on that Placido disc. So this was really powerful for me when I was a student trying to understand how a soft contact lens could really help with some of these irregular corneas. When I saw this picture, I thought, you know what, that does make sense. So you've got the top photos that they're super irregular as far as the Placido disc images. And then you put on this, um, this other lens and that really helps to smooth out the quality of the optics. Something else really interesting, I have this in my clinic. Um, it's, a, it's a corneal scleral profiler. Basically it, it checks the shape and the topography beyond the cornea. So most topographers on the market now, they just look at corneal topography. But now we're learning that it's so important to check the scleral topography because if you're fitting any sort of scleral lens, you're really fitting the sclera. The cornea is out of the equation at that point because you're vaulting all of that. You're vaulting the cornea, you're vaulting the limbus, you're vaulting all of that. So you're really fitting the sclera. So I think that we're gonna start seeing more and more trends on getting a scleral topography or, or some sort of imaging of that prior to fitting the, the patient. So this is great. So basically the patient, you have them in this machine and they look straight ahead, they look up, they look down, and then the, the SMAP or, or the scleral topographer is able to capture the images and then stitch them all together to give us an overall view of what's happening with the cornea or sorry, the sclera. So you can see here that um, it shows us what's going on with the topography of the actual scleral shape. And that has become really huge in my, in my clinic. I use this on, on almost every patient now so I can see what's going on with the scleral shape. And that helps me recommend certain options for patients. If I see a patient that has a very irregular sclera, I'm going to recommend a more custom scleral lens or, or I will pick a scleral lens that I know can account for that improve or in increased scleral tericity. Uh, a lot of options out there that just can't incorporate a lot of these um, toric peripheral curves or can only go to a certain amount. And so in those cases, I know it's just not gonna work for them. So I'm able to to kind of cater my recommendations based specifically on that patient. So this is just a, a patient that's wearing a custom soft lens for keratoconus. And you can see that it should fit very similarly like a soft lens. Um, if you've got a, a lens that's too flat, it's gonna move around everywhere. If you have a uh, patient that the lens is too steep, it's going to be sucked on and it's going to be really hard to, to take off. So I'm going to just take a few questions before we move on to the next lecture series because it's so much information that we're presenting. So I'll just take a few questions and then move, we'll move on to the next lecture. 
So I'm just going to look at this little area here. Okay, so I've got a um, few questions and then we'll move on to the next lecture. So first question, for the case on the hybrid lens, the first case, did you do corneal topography to determine if the right eye had keratoconus? Good question. So in, in the first case, um, that was actually one of my patients in, um, at the time I had two satellite clinics in Arizona and we did not have a topographer so we just had to go off of her Ks and refraction. So we did, we did not have a topography. That's a good question. Uh, by damp refraction, did I mean cycloplege? Yeah, so damp refraction, um, that's really, really good to do, especially for patients that have a lot of um, prescription, a lot of uh, cylinder. That's a lot of pediatrics, of course, are using damp refractions. So that would either mean cycloplegeing them. So you could use cyclo. Um, eye drops, or you could just use your terpicamide. You know, if you were dilating that patient, um, you could do their refraction after their dilation and just see if it matched up. So if I could go back um, and start over, I, I think I would have done that and see if I could have gotten more plus out of her and also more cylinder correction. So that's something that I would have done differently if I did it over again. Um, next question, why use a lens like this on her normal left eye? You know, that's a good question. And I think it's just because with hybrid lenses, they're, they've got um, a six month lifespan. So I find it easier to put patients in the same lens modality in both eyes, even if one eye doesn't particularly have to have it. But it, I just thought it would be easier for her to use the same type of lens for both eyes. Then she's not worried about two different care systems, two different replacement schedules, um, you know, needing tools for maybe one, maybe different ways to insert or remove the lens. So it was just kind of a, a choice I thought would be uh, more convenient for her. How do patients clean and store hybrids and what are their approximate costs? Um, hybrids uh, are definitely more expensive than just traditional soft lenses because they are more custom. And they can actually use a variety of cleaning products. So I prefer clear care just because um, the hydrogen peroxide base cleans the gas permeable lens center and then the soft skirt um, easily. Uh, it's, it's just a great option for, for patients. But it is also approved to use um, any sort of multi-purpose soft solution. So OptiFree, BioTrue, Revitalens, you know, all those different things would be fine for hybrid lenses. And then does a patient need preservative free saline to fill the bowl of the hybrid lens? They don't. Um, you can actually just use the multi-purpose soft solution and put it in. Uh, a lot of my patients do use preservative free solution. I think it's just because I have so many scleral lenses. So I'm just so used to prescribing that. And it just provides like a nice cushion. But because the hybrid lens, the tear exchange is so much faster than a scleral lens, you don't have to have a preservative free solution to fill the bowl. If you do notice some staining at their follow up visits, then that would be an indication to maybe switch them to something like that. Uh, but for the most part, they can just use their multi purpose solution to put to put in the bowl of the lens. Okay, next question if a patient complains of irritation associated with dry eye. Can you use artificial tears with a scleral hybrid? Great question. Yeah. So I always like to recommend specific products to my patients. So I'll always either put a sample in um, or I put that on their list of instructions. With scleral lenses and hybrids, you can really use anything that's preservative free that's out there. So if they, they just want to get something over the counter um, or you can use things that say for contacts. So there are some eye drops out there on the market 
that are designed for contact lenses. So I think the most important thing for patients is telling them that 90% of the eye drops that you see on the shelf um, at the store are not meant for contact lenses. That's meant to use in your eye without contacts. Um, and then I give them specific products that I recommend them using. And I think that really helps them so that they're not as confused. Are there different sizes of that O-ring to use? Yes, so there's different sizes out there. Um, I would say, I think it's O-ring number eight. I think I'm almost positive that's the, the size um, because it fits most scleral lenses when you're trying to balance it on, on the finger. Will you normally use soft custom lenses before trying scleral lenses to see if the optics are adequate? That is a great question. So because I do so many specialty lenses, I kind of know now which ones are gonna work and which ones are not gonna work. With soft custom lenses, those are only gonna work on patients that have more of a mild case. Um, if you have somebody that has a very irregular topography, um, it's very unlikely that a custom soft lens is gonna work that well. And that's just from personal experience from trying it on lots of different patients. But if they do have a mild case, we could certainly try a custom soft lens first. Or if you've tried a scleral lens or a hybrid on a patient and they're just not doing well for whatever reason, that it might be the only option for them. So even though they have more of a moderate disease, you may have to go back to a, a custom soft lens if it just doesn't work for them, if the other two. Um, who markets the soft contact lenses with the thicker masking centers? So good question. There's lots of labs out there. If you work with any sort of lab that manufactures gas permeable lenses, most all of them have a custom soft lens design. Um, so just reach out to the lab that you're currently using and ask them if they have a custom soft lens. It's, it's a great option. Uh, if, if you can't, then you can just kind of search it um, or look for another uh, laboratory and see what their options are, but almost all of them have. There are a few of them that don't have any custom soft lenses, but almost all uh, gas permeable lens manufacturers, if you, whatever company you're using, they probably, all, they probably already have one. So they could send you like a loaner fitting set in case you wanted to try it. Uh, can you use fluorescein to check the hybrid fit? Absolutely. So um, nowadays with the new hybrid lenses with a silicone hydrogel skirt, you can actually just use regular fluorescein. If you were in school uh, when, we, when you're using some of the other lenses, you had to use that high molecular weight fluorescein. You don't need to do that anymore because all of the hybrid lenses, uh, especially the newer generations, have a sci high skirt, so you don't, you don't need that. Can you use uh, pre preservative-free artificial tears with oil like ref Refresh Omega with hybrid and scleral lenses? Good question. Yeah, there are a few um, products out there that have additional ingredients. And I would just say that you have to just experiment with the patient. So some patients, they can't tolerate it because it makes their, their eyes too blurry when they put the, those types of lenses on because of the additional components. Other patients find that it works really well. So I always try using the ones without some of these added things first. And then um, after that, I will, I will move on to su suggesting something like that uh, later. But I have found that some of the patients find that it makes their lenses blurry because it sticks onto the gas permeable lens or soft lens material. Other patients, it doesn't bother them at all and they prefer it. So that's just kind of my own experience. When you choose different lens modality for keratoconus, do you go off by K readings to get a feel for what lens modality might work? Um, yes. So the Ks, if they're if they're less than like 50, I would say for steep K, there's a good chance that a soft lens could work for that patient. If it's over that or their let or their topography is incredibly irregular, um, I just go straight for either a hybrid lens, uh, corneal GP, or a scleral in, in, in most cases. 
Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next presentation and uh, and then just keep asking questions. I'll, I'll be sure to get to, to those at the end of the next one. Okay, so moving on to the next lecture, the diameter debate. So this lecture, we're gonna talk about large versus small diameter scleral lenses. If you need to get a hold of me, um, you, I have a website, drstephaniewood.com. You feel free to email me any questions if I didn't get to them today. Um, I also have Facebook and, and Twitter or Instagram, and I post a lot of really cool, interesting cases uh, most of them are on irregular corneas, um, and there you can get a hold of me that way as well. I want to say thanks to Dr. Langis Michaud, and he helped me kind of develop uh, my portion of their presentation and gave me a lot of images and, and things which um, are really cool. And then also Dr. Lynette Johns and I, uh, she, she and I are the original developers of this presentation. We gave this presentation at GSLS a few years back. So I wanna say thanks to her for letting me borrow her content. Um, again, my financial disclosures. Okay, so this is a chart that some of you guys might remember but this was kind of going on and talking about scleral lens categories and diameter. So if you remember, we defined corneal scleral lenses, semi-scleral, mini-scleral, and full scleral based off of their overall diameter. And then we decided that was not a good approach because if a corneal scleral lens is 12.9 to 13.5, um, but what happens if you have a microcornea? Let's say that the, the entire diameter of the cornea was only eight millimeters. A 12.9 millimeter lens would be a full scleral lens at that case, because it's not touching the cornea and the sclera at that point. So we decided that we're going to change this. Scleral Lens Education Society uh, got together um, and, and we decided that this is a much better way of describing lenses and, and their fitting relationships. So a corneal lens, the definition of the bearing area is that it is resting entirely on the cornea. So if you think of a corneal GP, it fits on the cornea, it doesn't touch the limbus, it doesn't touch the, the sclera at all. Corneal scleral, the lens is resting partly on the cornea and partly on the sclera. There's not many of these designs left. There are a, a few out there where the, the fitting process, you actually touch part of the cornea and part of the sclera, but 95% of the lenses on the market for sclerals actually fall into these categories, mini scleral or large scleral. Both of them, um, the, the bearing is entirely on the sclera but the mini scleral is the lens is up to six millimeters larger than HVID, whereas a large is going beyond that. So not really that much of a difference between the mini and, and large. They're both resting entirely on the sclera, but that might kind of help us as we kind of go through some of these different cases and talking about the large versus the small diameters. So how do you select a diameter? It's really important to check the HVID because that a lot of times will kind of help you determine which diameter to start with. There's a variety of ways that we can do this. We can use different devices. Um, you can use these in the center. This is like a little HVID ruler. And a lot of the labs that make scleral lenses, they have these they, and they give them out for free. So if you do have a question um, or you want to get one of these, just get in touch with your lab and ask them if they can send you one. And then if you have any sort of topographer, almost all of them have some sort of a, a measuring tool that will tell you what the diameter is in, in all the different areas of their um, uh, cornea. And something interesting is that we're learning that as we analyze corneal shape more and more, that the 
the cornea is actually not round. There's actually a difference between the horizontal and the vertical meridians. So that's like some interesting research that's going on right now. Um, but at, at any rate, you want to definitely have some sort of a gauge on what their HVID is because that will help you select an initial diameter. If you've got somebody that's got a megalocornea or a microcornea, that also is going to kind of help you determine which, um, which diameter to, to start with. Okay, with the corneal scleral lens, this is just one of the different options that's out there. This means that you're going to touch part of the cornea and part of the sclera. Um, this is a patient uh, where they put the lens on, it was too steep, uh, not top left where you've got that bubble. It was too flat on the top right, too much bearing on the center cornea. And on the bottom, that's the optimal fit of this corneal scleral lens. So you can see there is some bearing or touch around that mid peripheral cornea near the limbus. Um, but then there's clearance in the center of the lens. And then the rest of the bearing of the lens is on the actual sclera. Larger diameter lenses are just a little bit bigger than a small diameter lens, some of the smaller lenses. And why do we choose large diameters? Um, so let's go over a few reasons and, and indications on why would we pick a mini scleral lens versus a full scleral lens. So here's one benefit. Patients that have incredibly difficult, um, super irregular corneas like this one, uh, where we've got a very, very bulging cornea, uh, patients that have these transplants that, uh, that, that you can't vault with anything, those are patients that are ideal candidates for some of these larger diameter lenses. Sometimes we just need a larger um, amount of sagittal depth to even vault the, the cornea at all. So something to remember is that as you increase the sagittal height, usually you have to increase the diameter a bit to support that. There are some designs that um, they kind of interact independently, but uh, for the most part, when you have these incredibly irregular corneas, you will need to go with a larger diameter lens. So sometimes we have to remember that the, the lens design you're working with, some lens designs will steepen the base curve and then that steepens the sagittal depth of the lens. Other designs, even if you change the base curve, the sagittal depth is unreflected. So it's really important to make sure that you understand the scleral lens design you're working with because it can vary drastically between companies. The limbus is really, really important. Sometimes um, there's lens designs that we, we get a great central fit Everything looks great with the, with the scleral lens, but there's some staining on the limbus or you're worried about the stem cells or something else is going on. So sometimes you need a larger diameter scleral lens to be able to vault that limbal area. Some of the other benefits of larger diameters is that it allows enough material to go over these extreme corneas. So let's look at this lens, or this patient has got Tyrion's marginal degeneration. If you have a patient like this, there's no way you're gonna use a smaller diameter lens because you don't wanna be touching that limbal area, um, and that delicate tissue. You wanna make sure you're getting over that and make sure that you're getting around all of this. Same thing with patients like Salzman's nodular degeneration or some of these other really extreme cases where they just got a really um, irregular surface, you're going to want to vault over all of that completely. You don't want to touch those areas because that could cause erosion. It can cause uh, discomfort. It can cause a lot of other issues when you're kind of smushing that, those areas. You want to just get over all of, all of this. Scleral lenses, if you're trying to protect the ocular surface, such as those uh, cases that we just 
looked at, you're going to want to go bigger because you want to get over all of those structures of irregularity and bathe the surface of that, of, of that eye all day. Here's some other interesting ones. Trichiasis. So if you've got a patient where their eyelids or lashes are, are curving inward and they are scratching the cornea all day, you're going to want to go with a larger diameter lens to help protect the eye um, from those eyelashes. Uh, dystochiasis, same thing. You want a larger lens to help prevent any issues there and keratinized lid margins. So with the bottom photo, if you've got some sort of condition that has caused the eyelid to get really rough and keratinized and yucky, imagine that when you're blinking and that eyelid is not smooth and it's and it doesn't feel good it's got this really rough spot that's going to be so uncomfortable for the patient it's going to cause all these issues with the cornea so putting a scleral on, lens on to protect the eyeball from the eyelid can be so helpful for these types of patients so we went over in the last lecture a couple um you know, reasons why we would use some of these instruments. So we've got a couple options here. Actually, there's three options now where we've got the eaglet eye, we've got the S map, which we talked about in the last lecture. And then there's also the Pentacam has something called the CSP, the Cornell Scleral Profiler. It's a software. But basically, all three of them, the premise is the same. We're trying to map the scleral shape. And that's going to help us identify any sort of irregularities on the sclera, whether it's some sort of asymmetric scleral shape, uh, maybe they've got a very large pterygium or a pinguecula or some other really strange things that's go that are going on. These instruments have been awesome in evaluating the shape of the actual sclera. And then that can guide us to which type of lens that we want to fit. This is such an interesting study that was done uh, by, by Greg Denayer and, and a bunch of other people. But basically they checked 152 eyes and they, they wanted to find out how many patients actually have a spherical scleral shape. And look here, only 5.7% of patients have a scleral shape that's spherical, so not many. That tells us that most patients, so like 95% of our patients in scleral lenses are going to need some sort of toric peripheral curve. We did not know this 10 years ago. The, the scleral lenses that were used 10 years ago were all spherical because we, we thought that the scleral shape was basically spherical. And so the entire shape around the scleral lens was the, the same. We had no idea. And now with some of this research that has come out, which I think is so interesting, we now we know, oh my gosh, we really need to be fitting scleral lenses that have toric peripheral curves. And then something else interesting from this study, regular toric scleral lenses, that's only 28%. So that means that let's say at the three and nine, it's the same and the six and 12 is the same. Only 28% of patients fall into this toric scleral shape that's regular. So it's exactly um, 90 degrees away from each other. So that leaves us with basically the majority of the patients actually have asymmetric um, scleral toricity and that is huge. That tells us that most patients wearing scleral lenses are not going to fall into a spherical design. So that's probably out of the question for most patients. And a lot of them can't even get into the regular toric peripheral curves. So that this is so interesting to me because when this study came out, I looked at a lot of my lens orders and I realized that I was fitting so many patients with with spherical toric curves. And according to this data, that was completely wrong. I should have been fitting more patients with toric peripheral curves. And even if I was doing that, you're not going to get a lot of them to be perfect because a lot of them are actually asymmetric. 
So this is, I think, such an interesting study. And the more and more research we do, we're seeing that scleral shape is so irregular for a lot of patients. So I think that over time, we are actually going to see a lot of these scleral lenses in more customizable shapes. Because look here, so many patients will not fall into these standard categories. They're going to need something that's more custom. Um, something else cool with these larger diameter lenses is we get some of these cool things. Um, you can get a spherical uh, toric or spherical peripheral curve if you need it, but from the last study we just looked at, there's barely anybody that's going to need a, a scleral uh, periphery that's that's spherical. We're going to have to go to toric. You can even do quadrant specific for a lot of lens designs out there now. Um, there's something called the pros, and then there's also impression based. So in this case, you can see with this lens, look how asymmetric that is. The, this is so interesting because as we get fit, as we get into fitting scleral lenses more and more, we're realizing, wow, the patient's eye looks like this. How crazy. So I just think that that's something really, really important that uh, we need to keep in the back of our minds. One of the disadvantages to some of the larger diameter lenses is the handling, getting the lenses in and, and taking them out. The... Um, the issues that we've got with obstacles is when we get into these larger designs, now we're going to have to incorporate more custom issues. If they've got a pinguecula that's like really elevated, uh, like in that left-hand photo, we're going to need to do something to kind of vault that area or, or create a notch. If they've got some blepharon, you really need to have something a lot more custom to go around that area. And if they've got a tube or a trab, something with glaucoma, you really have to be very careful. And a traditional scleral lens is for sure not going to work on these types of patients. So just kind of going back into scleral lens indications to begin with, we've got all these different options for patients that have all these different issues. So I uh, won't go into all of these, but we've got lots of patients that that can benefit from scleral lenses. And this, I think, was so cute that Dr. Longis Michaud, um, he had this slide that, that said, you don't have to shoot a mosquito with a bazooka. Use a lens with the lowest risk. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the smaller diameter scleral lenses and who would be a good candidate for those. Some of the benefits of smaller diameter sclerals, which we're gonna go into each of these, is they're easier to handle they don't decenter as much, so the optics can be better, especially for multifocal patients. There's less issue with fogging from the posterior tear lens, and there's reduced tr troubleshooting, such as conjunctival chalasis, um, tight lens syndrome, things like that. Uh, less issues with scleral shape because the smaller the diameter, the less toricity we're having to worry about. And then possibly there's more oxygen, long-term health, because you're not um, having to make the lens so large. Here's some good candidates, patients that have irregular corneas and diseased eyes. And the newer trend for scleral lenses are patients that have normal corneas. Uh, maybe they've got fluctuating vision with their current contact lenses. Maybe they've got super high amounts of plus or minus. Maybe they've got lots of astigmatism and soft contact lenses are just not cutting it for them. Uh, athletes, and this is not just like professional athletes, but these are patients that are um, even in high school uh, or even beyond, you know, if you're wanting to use contact lenses uh, for, for any sports or, or even just any other athletic activities, you could wear them on a part-time basis for those. So patients uh, that have high hyperopia. So think about patients that have these really, really thick glasses, make them look bug eye, things like that. Um, a lot of times it can improve their vision and could be really, really good for patients that have these very extreme prescriptions. Same thing with myopia. If you've got a really, really high amount of myopia, 
uh, can cause you to have these kind of beady eyes. You've got these really thick areas on the glasses. Um, and like for me personally, I've got a very high amount of myopia. And when I put my glasses on, the peripheral vision is very bizarre. So I always feel like uncomfortable driving at nighttime because I feel like my vision's not the best. But with, with my contact lenses, I feel much more comfortable uh, getting around. Astigmatism, um, it, it's a great option for patients with higher amounts of astigmatism because with soft contact lenses, the standard ones anyway, we can only get to certain amounts. But uh, with these scleral lenses, they're so customizable, you can really fit patients with any amounts of astigmatism with these lenses. Um, Anisometropia, if they for some reason don't get in, they don't fall in the category of a soft lens, um, you can always use it. And, and something good about this is that it could be covered under medically necessary contacts. So you might even be able to get insurance to bill this. Current GP wearers, if they, uh, if they complain that they're always getting stuff behind their lenses, they work in a dusty, windy environment and, they, and they're complaining like, oh my gosh, it, it's just, it's so uncomfortable. Um, I, I have to take the lens out every time I get something behind the lens, uh, that they might be a good option. And patients that, uh, that wear corneal GP lenses and then they just, they complain that uh, the lens is popping out. They, they you know, every time their eye gets dry, it falls out. Or if they ride a motorcycle, lots of motorcycle patients here in the Southwest uh, that complain that their lenses like fly out. So can you imagine you're driving on the freeway in a motorcycle and your gas permeable lens just flew out of your eye? I mean, what do you do at that point? So those are patients that could be good candidates for scleral lenses. Piggyback patients. The whole point of using a piggyback system is to improve comfort and to improve the stability of the lens. So you put the soft contact lens on first, and then you put the corneal GP on second. Now, the whole point is to improve comfort and stability, but you're going to solve that with the scleral lens. Um, and the reason that I like switching them into like either a hybrid or a scleral option is because they're not having to worry about two separate lens modalities, two different replacement schedules, two different solution types. Um, with, with a piggyback system, you're using a soft lens for um, uh, comfort, but you could use a daily lens. So they have to throw those away all the time. Maybe they're in a monthly lens. So they have to remember to replace it every month. Whereas their corneal GP lens, they're not having to replace it very often. You know, there's so many different things that could get confusing. So I always believe the simplest approach is the best. And anything we can do to improve the convenience for the patient is going to help tremendously. Patients that have aphakia, so maybe they've got glasses that are super thick. Um, uh, there's not a ton of patients like this running around, but there are some. Most of my aphakic patients, they just don't wear anything or they have got a balanced lens in their glasses. Uh, another thing that's cool is that aphakic patients usually have a benefit for medically necessary contacts with their medical or their vision insurance. So it could be something kind of cool to consider for these people. Presbyopia, there's not a lot of options like we talked about before uh, for patients that have presbyopia and astigmatism. So this does give us another option for those types of patients. Or patients that are wearing corneal GPs uh, that, uh, that want to get into something that's a newer technology. Uh, a lot of these scleral lens companies have funneled a lot of money and research into their multifocal designs. So they're, they're usually quite successful and quite good. And then patients that have dry eyes. Sometimes we've got patients that wear soft contact lenses and we try all these different soft lenses and they just, they can't wear them. Their, their eyes are too dry. And in, in, in some of my patients, a scleral lens is the only type of contact lens they can wear. And that's because you've got this tear chamber that you're seeing here that is bathing the eye with liquid all day. So there's just some patients that they try a million soft lenses. You could try every single contact lens on the market and they just can't wear it because their eyes too dry. 
And it might be because they've got some sort of aqueous deficient issue and they need something like this to not only protect their eye, but to provide comfort. So if you've got a patient, you're thinking in your head, oh my gosh, I do have a patient. We've tried every single soft contact lens and they can't get used to it. You might wanna consider a scleral lens because of that tear chamber. If you've, if you've got a patient that's unhappy with a current soft toric lens, let's say that the lens is rotating, um, maybe the, their prescription is not exactly the prescription that they're wearing in the contact lens, they could also be a good option. Um, patients have got fluctuating vision with their soft toric lenses and dryness with their soft toric lenses. The normal cornea shapes are easier to fit the, than diseased eyes, in my opinion, and that's because they have predictable shapes. They've got predictable eccentricity. Um, they've got normal prolate shape. So there's less troubleshooting and complications. And that's because the corneas are healthy uh, for the most part with these normal corneas that don't have any diseases going on. Um, they don't have the risk that these irregular corneas have where they're, they're not producing a lot of mucin. Um, they're not producing, they don't have a lot of edema because of endothelial issues and um, their tear film structure is quite normal. They're easier to handle. So here's a picture of a 14.9 versus an 18.2. 14.9 diameter, it's not much bigger than their like a regular soft toric lens. Soft toric lenses, most of them are like 14.5 diameters uh, for just a regular soft toric lens that we're using now. So it's not a much bigger than that. So it's less intimidating uh, to the patient. But if they go from like a 14.5 uh, to an 18.2, that lens is a lot bigger. And so when they see it, they're like, oh my gosh, this thing is huge. How am I going to get this thing into my eye? So sometimes with patients that have um, the, the smaller diameter lenses, they're, they're less apprehensive and they have less anxiety. So here's an interesting case report. I have a patient, he's 15 years old and he was referred to the clinic for possible contact lens fitting. He was diagnosed with unilateral corneal ectasia and that was from a prior injury. He got hit with a football in his eye when he was younger. He's got great vision in the right eye, poor vision in the left. So you can see the topography, very normal, right eye looks fine but the left eye almost has like a keratoconus pattern. Uh, you've got that hot spot on the bottom there. And, um, and so that's what's causing his irregular vision. Um, with the right eye, he sees 2020, left eye 2200. With a refraction, he does take a lot of cylinder correction, but even then we're only getting him to 2060 with spectacles. Plus, the right eye basically having nothing and then the left eye having so much prescription that could cause him to be a little bit disoriented with glasses um, because of the major difference in prescription. Uh, so first I tried a scleral lens um, and insertion was incredibly difficult. I actually had to use a lid speculum to get the scleral lens in, which should have been my first clue that this is not gonna work. Uh, the, the, the fact that I had to use a speculum to get the lens in the eye, not good. Uh, that means that uh, when he comes in for his dispense, how is he going to get this thing in his own eye? But you live and you learn, you make mistakes. And that's why I like to teach you guys so you can learn from my mistakes and not make the same ones. Uh, so if you're using a speculum to get the lens in, very low chance that they're going to be able to get it in themselves. So super apprehensive and scared, but you could see the lens fit looks beautiful. It looks amazing. All of those blood vessels running underneath the lens, it's vaulting the limbus. It looks incredible. What a beautiful fit. And he could get to 2025 vision. So I thought, well, he's seen so well with the lens. Maybe he'll be motivated to put the lens in uh, because his vision is so good. So he, he had some issues with insertion removal. He wanted to try. He really gave it his honest try. Um, but at his follow-up, he's just, he still could not get this thing in. He was just super scared to insert and remove the lens. Next, we decided to try a custom soft lens. 
Uh, so I fit him into a custom keratoconus lens. So because his topography was very similar to what we would see with the keratoconus patient. And we ordered the lens. You can see the vision is not as good as the scleral lens, but he has no issue getting the lens in, getting the lens out. So sometimes you have to think of what the goal is for the patient. And for him, he was so much better at getting the lens in and taking it out with the soft lens compared to the scleral lens that it's worth it for him to sacrifice some of the vision. You know, he's not seeing as well as with the gas permeable lens type option. Um, but that's going to give him a stepping stone. So maybe he does this for a few years and then he gets used to touching his eye and getting the lens in and out. And maybe he'll be ready to try a scleral lens in the future or a hybrid lens or something where he's, um, he's using a different lens modality. So there's less optical decentration. We talked about this in the last lecture, but see how the optics of the um, multifocal, we can see these little hash marks here. That's the center of the lens. And if you've got this lens that's centered inferior temporally, the vision is not gonna be that good. The good news is a lot of labs now that make scleral multifocals are doing decentered optics because they know that the lens is going to decenter down and out. Uh, but so this is just another reason that if you've got a smaller diameter, it doesn't tend to decenter nearly as much as if you have a larger diameter. Uh, just another photo um, from my friend Tom Arnold, but you can see the, cent the center of the lens. Um, is definitely decentered inferior temporal. So the vision, if it, especially if this is a multifocal patient, is not going to be ideal. Um, there's a lot of studies going on right now with tear fogging and tear chamber of debris and scleral lens fogging. We do notice that patients that have smaller diameter lenses get less fogging. And it could be a variety of reasons. Maybe it's because we're using larger diameter lenses on more of these diseased patients. And so they're already producing more issues and they already have more issues. So maybe that's the reason. But I, I do think it has a lot to do with the fact that you're not pressing down on the conjunctiva as much with some of these smaller diameter lenses. So you're not having much more of that mucin response. And then conjunctival chalasis. This is something that can happen with scleral lenses. So we can see in this photo, do you see how there's this kind of conjunctiva that's kind of sucked in? It's kind of sucked in onto over that limbus area. In the beginning, we thought this was just a benign thing and no big deal, just let the patient go on. But as we've done more research, we've realized, you know what, this is not a good thing because what can happen is that tissue is over the limbus. So first of all, that's not good because now we're decreasing the amount of oxygen getting to the limbus with this extra conjunctival layer that's kind of pressed on top. And if you have this patient and they're wearing the lens over and over and over again every day, it can actually start to adhere to the cornea. So that's not good. Having this layer of conjunctiva that's smushed onto the limbus and now you can't peel it back when they take their lens off. So we've discovered this is not a good situation. So if you do have a patient with chalasis, try your best to, to work with the lab and, and decrease that as much as possible because you don't want to have those types of issues in the future. Also, some of the patients, when you fit them with larger diameter scleral lenses, you can have this suction effect where the, there's too much vault in the center and it's actually sucking part of that limbal um, and the area right outside the limbus into that area and could create this kind of vacuum. Uh, peripheral edge alignment as well. When you get into these larger diameter lenses, the scleral tericity increases. So as you increase the scleral tericity, now we're having to deal with all sorts of issues in the, the, with the edges. So if you're new to fitting scleral lenses, it's a lot easier to start fitting these smaller diameter, in my opinion, and going larger, because once you get to these larger diameters, 
you're really dealing with a lot of issues when it comes to um, the scleral tericity and some of these edge problems. Another thing that uh, we don't know yet, but if we've got a smaller diameter lens um, or a larger diameter and it's squishing the areas beyond the limbus, does that affect the uveal scleral outflow as far as you know the the outflow in these in these patients' eyes? And we don't know that yet. And there's a lot of studies that are going on right now trying to check the pressure, uh, making sure that scleral lens patients do not end up developing glaucoma over time. So uh, there's a lot of research going on right now. But just to be safe, we definitely want to not be compressing the conjunctiva as much as possible since we don't know if that's gonna affect things long-term. And then lastly, how much oxygen actually gets to the cornea? Um, because first it's gotta, the oxygen goes through the tear film, then it's gotta get through that piece of plastic, basically the scleral lens, then it has to go through the tear chamber. So basically what they're filling the bowl of the lens with that saline, there it's going through the tear chamber and then it's getting to the cornea. So how much oxygen is really getting to the eye? Well, there's lots of theoretical um, oxygen deliveries in lots of different research uh, papers, which I'll just show you. Um, so basically predicted outcome, you wanna have the lens decay as much as high as you can and you wanna have the central clearance of the lens as low as you can, and that is going to maximize the amount of oxygen getting to the eye. Same thing with this other study, uh, saying that in order to get the most oxygen to the cornea, you want the most hyper decay material possible. You want the least amount of central clearance. You, you want as low amount of clearance as possible. Um, and, and uh, you want to make that thickness of the scleral lens as thin as possible to maximize the, the amount of oxygen. So uh, these, these are all so many different, um, papers that have been, uh, published. So makes sense, right? If you've got a giant scleral lens, it's this thick, it's going to be really hard for oxygen to get in. And if you've got the scleral lens is fit really you know, you've got that thin layer, but you've got a giant amount of tear um, chamber. So if you've got a thousand microns, the oxygen has to go through the scleral lens and then the tear layer and then to the cornea. So you want to minimize that as much as you can, but by still, but still being safe. And uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of answer some questions here. Again, if you need to get a hold of me, you can find me drstephaniewu.com. Um, and follow me on social media if you have questions, but I am going to answer a few questions now. Okay, the next question, can one use a corneal topographer with eccentric fixation to map the sclera? Yeah, that's a good question. So I actually do have quite a few patients that they don't have very good vision. And so they kind of, I kind of have to direct them on where to look. But yes, if the patient is looking off to the side, you can still map the scleral shape, which is fine because no matter where they're looking, because you're getting several different images, it's going to stitch all those images anyway. So even if they're not looking exactly down or exactly up, they're looking off to the side of it, that's okay because you're getting so many images, it's going to just stitch it together. If a clinician does not have instrumentation to analyze scleral tericity, is it possible to make decisions from the slit lamp observation when ordering? Great question. Yeah, and I don't think it's, it's not worth it, in my opinion, to buy a, a scleral topographer if you're not fitting a lot of scleral lenses. I mean, it's kind of a waste of money, right? Because you're having to pay a ton of money for this instrument and you're only using it, you know, once a month. So um, I don't think that's a huge reason to, to purchase one um, if you're not doing them a ton. Great question. Yes. Most commonly what you're going to see is you're going to see blanching at the three and nine o'clock. So in that horizontal meridian with the scleral lens, if you see that there's a lot of um, blanching there, 
that means that it's there's not enough touristy at that three and nine, and you're going to need to increase the amount of touristy. If you have a patient that's got a large amount of touristy, what you might even see is bubbles happening at 12 or six o'clock. And that's because it's pressing down at the three and nine, and then it's lifting up at 12 and six, and there's little bubbles that are starting to get into the lens. So those are the two most common things that you might see. And then all you have to do is either take pictures and send them to the lab consultant or, um, or tell them on the phone, like, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of compression or I'm seeing a little bit of compression at, at three and nine. Um, and they can make the adjustments to increase the amount of scleral peripheral tericity of the lens when you order it. So yeah, that's not an issue at all. I didn't have a scleral topographer until like two years ago. So totally doable to order scleral lenses with increased amounts of scleral tericity without having something like that. Will scleral lenses decrease endothelial cells in long term? I don't think we know that yet. Um, there are a lot of patients that have been wearing scleral lenses for like 20 plus years uh, from you know some of the, the people that fit them in the very beginnings and I, they have never published something like that. But um, for sure, if you have a patient that has a corneal transplant, you need to monitor their endothelial health very carefully because I've had a lot of patients where their endothelium just can't keep up and it becomes edematous and they get, you know, bullae or, you know, a lot of other issues can happen. So if you are fitting scleral lenses on transplants, be really, really careful because their endothelium can be at risk. What's the maximum wearing time for scleral lenses to reduce oxygen deprivation, especially patients with corneal disease? Good question. I would say most of my patients are able to get like eight to 10 hours of wear, which is basically all day. A lot of my patients that don't have disease corneas can wear them basically all day, every day, but you have to just monitor them carefully. So that's why I like to see patients for their follow-ups in the afternoon so I can see what's happening. They put their lenses on, let's say at 6 a.m. And then I see them at 3 p.m. And I can actually take a look at the cornea to see if there's any staining. Is there any edema? Is the lens fitting relationship changing at all? So it's important to see the patients after they've worn the lenses for a few hours. So then that way you can predict what's going on um, throughout the day. Uh, do you have a specific filling solution preference for scleral lenses? Um, the, there's, a, there's several different options for filling solutions. There's the regular non-preserved sodium chloride, which you can just um, write a prescription for. There is um, like the Addy pack, which you can get off of Amazon or, or any online venue. There's scleral fill, which is produced by Bausch & Lomb. There is Lacropure, which is produced by Menicon. Um, and then there's Nutrafil, which is produced by Contimac. So those are three filling solutions that are kind of um, available. I prefer the ones that are branded more than the Addy pack. And that's just because the pH of those is so variable. And when they get them to um, different, uh, different sources, they've actually done some research that show if you buy the Addy pack um, off Amazon or whatever, uh, sometimes you're getting different pHs and, and other issues. So the, I don't recommend those as much. They are convenient though, because you can purchase them on online and get them really quickly, but it's not my preferred filling solution. I prefer some of the more branded ones that I, that I just spoke about. Uh, besides medically necessary, how often can and should sclerals be replaced when it comes to Medicare DMERC? Um, I always tell patients that they'll, they're able to, the lifespan of scleral lenses is between one and three years. Um, I will not let patients go beyond that because the, the material usually starts breaking down anyway because it's so oxygen permeable that they get scratches and deposits a lot more. And um, yeah, so following Medicare DME guidelines, uh, it used to be they could only replace it once every five years, but I think that they've changed it because I've had some patients that are able to get it again after a year. So I don't know if it depends on the patient's plan um, or if maybe they've changed things, or maybe it's based on diagnosis codes. I, I'm not quite sure. 
What's the first step for dealing with conjunctival chalasis? Try a smaller diameter or adjusting the peripheral curve. If you have conjunctival chalasis, it's usually because the limbal clearance is too excessive uh, or the edge of the lens is too steep. It's squishing in that area. So if you already have a well-fitting scleral lens, I wouldn't necessarily start all over again and with a smaller diameter lens. I would just take a look, especially if, it, if you have an OCT, and take a look in that area because most likely what's happening is the limbal area is there's too much clearance there and the edge is too steep. So you're going to need to maybe modify um, and adjust to make the limbal clearance less and then the edge um, higher. Is a small scleral lens more comfortable than a soft toric? That's an interesting question. I actually had a study in here that I didn't get to, but um, there was a study done where we compared small diameter scleral lenses compared to soft toric lenses, and the comfort was actually rated uh, the same between the two. So really, really similar as far as comfort goes. Uh, do you have a go-to DK for average thickness scleral lenses? Um, anything hyper DK I think is fine. So there's optimum extra, there's infinite material, there's acuity material, there's optimum extreme, there's Menicon Z. I mean, there's so many hyper DK materials on the market now. Um, I, I just asked the lab for their choice. If I do have a patient that has a very diseased eye, like a, a transplant, I will make sure that I try to get them in like a, an infinite or acuity material because that's about 200 DK. So I'm going to try to maximize the, the oxygen on those patients. If a patient's asymp asymptomatic with a scleral lens with a pterygium or a pinguecula, but you can tell that's causing some compression, is that okay? Um, I, I think that's a really um, tricky question because my fitting philosophy has changed over the years and I don't like to have any compression on anything now. I like to have everything really well aligned. Um, I think it's just safer for the eye long term and it causes less problems with the patient. But if, if your uh, lens design doesn't allow for notching or doesn't have any issues, I, I probably wouldn't worry about it and I would just closely monitor them. So I have patients where I didn't have a corneal topographer. I didn't have an OCT and I was fitting scleral lenses, you know, 10 years ago. And um, I just kind of had to do my best judgment. And back in that time, there were no options for notching or there were no micro vaults. There was no way to vault over these, you know, pingueculas. And so I just monitored them long-term and most patients are doing just fine. So I would just say careful monitoring, especially if the patient's not complaining. And if it's only mild, I think it's just fine to just monitor those long-term. Okay, and last question, how difficult is it to take a mold of the eye? Um, it's not that difficult, but you have to get, you have to have your technique down. And I would say it, I've done over 100 at this point, and I still feel like my technique is improving. And uh, yeah, just wanna say thanks so much for Berkeley for inviting me to participate in this lecture. And uh, yeah, any other questions, please get a hold of me. I'm happy to answer those. So thanks very much.